So let's go through what we are going to go uh, and uh, say in this talk, right? So basically, we're going to discuss about threading, race conditions, thread safety, synchronization primitives, and making your programs thread safe. Yeah. So why use threading? To improve, improve your application efficiency by using concurrent execution and improve your responsiveness. And to make you understand a little better, I'm going to show you an example of a simple banking app. So here you go. I've just used SQL SQL model, which is a uh, simple library in Python that you can use to you know, uh, work with SQL on your local projects and maybe even bigger ones. So you just have to uh, look through the with statements in this uh, slide. Basically, the first with statement allows you to delete an account, and the second one allows you to add an account. And you can see a lot of sessions uh, uh, throughout this code to just make you know your uh, code safe and uh, transactions reversible and all that. And if we look deeper into this code, you can see that we have created three accounts uh, with ID and uh, a name and a balance uh, to each of them. So we have John, Jane, and Alice as examples for now, and each of them has a $100 balance in their account. And if you look uh, down below, you can see the account model made with the SQL model that has an ID, which is an int and a primary key, and a name and a balance. OK, let's go further. So just to look at the initial table, uh, we can see that John, Jane, and Alice with IDs and their balance. So the total balance money in the bank is basically $300 or so, right? And uh, now we can take a look at the transfer code. So I have written this code to just, you know, uh, to be able to transfer from one, from one account to another and a fixed amount of money, right? So basically, we have two functions. One is transfer money and one is display balance. And we're using sessions in uh, both these places. And the display balance just gets the account and then loops through the results to show the balance of that particular account. And when we look into the transfer money function, you can see that we have a from user and a to user uh, that is taken as arguments. And then we uh, deduct the balance from the user and add the balance to the to user, right? And we commit that particular session. So that's what it basically does. Now, let's go a bit further. Okay. So now this is a operation which is completely sequential. We are not using any threads. It should go as easy as it is, right? So now let's look at this function. We initialize the DB, we display the balance first, and then we do a couple of transfers. Now, if you look at the uh, variable two transfers, which is the list of tuple, and it has the from ID in the first index, the to ID in the second index, and we also have the amount in the third one, right? So we are performing a, a particular set of transactions for all, on these accounts with these amounts, right? So what would be the dis, uh, uh, balance after doing this process? Let's look at the output of the display balance function. So basically what we did is transfer from John to Jane $10, then Jane to Alice $10, then Alice to uh, John to Alice again, another $10, which is $120, right? And then we transfer from Alice to John again. So Alice, John should have 90, Jane should have 100, and Alice should have 110. Basic, simple mathematics, right? And it works perfectly in the sequential order. So the money in the bank is still $300. Now let's look at another example. And uh, so yeah, so the, the transfers are completely sequential, which is a bit slow, as you can see, because it has to wait for each and every single transaction to complete before it starts the next one. Now let's see a concurrent transaction with uh, using multiple threads. <clears throat> so again, the only difference here that is the with statement is using a thread pool executor <clears throat> with a maximum number of 10 threads, right? And this is also uh, doing the same exact process, but this process now has 10 different workers trying to do this particular transactions. Now it should... Uh, return the same yield the same results that we saw in the slide before but since the cpu chooses when and where to execute these processes these functions we'll get a weird result let's see that in the next slide so yeah the money in the bank has uh gone down by 
10, which is not possible, right? Normally, it's not possible. It's not right, basically. So the money should be finite. It is being transferred among these accounts, which means that the money should be the same. But let's see what happened here. It's 90, 90, and 110. Okay, let's see what happened. So debugging the current issue, it is something that happens when you use uh, concurrent reads and writes while using threading. Now, this can lead to something called race conditions. We'll look at that in the next few slides. OK, so what are race conditions? Race conditions normally occur when we work with shared mutable data. So since the threads are sharing the same memory under the same process, it, all of them has access to the same memory. And we have not used any kind of you know, uh, technologies to, to actually, actually restrict access to one thread at a time. So this happens. One thread goes and mutates a particular data, another thread does the same, another thread does the same, and the condition does not match, and we get completely different results. Uh, okay, give me a second here. All right. So if the Operations operations are non-atomic. -atom when the context uh, just basically the threads get switched in between each other, you get weird results. Let's see why that happens. Okay, so race conditions. Let's get into a bit deeper example when it comes to race conditions. First, we will just see what context switching is, right? So when you come to this example, you can see that we are using uh, a loop down below that is just you know iterating over a range of numbers from zero to three zero to two right uh so the threading the thread function is starting a new thread with the worker and the argument which is just zero one and two right so that's what actually happens so now we also get to see that the swiss dot sys dot get switch interval returned 0 0.005 seconds that is basically saying that Every 0 0.005 second, if the, the CPU would try to switch, switch which thread is executing a particular task. So every 0 0.5 seconds, it'll just check, OK, if the thread 2 is free, let's hand over the control to thread 2 instead of thread 1. OK, again, it'll check. And if the thread 1 is free, now hand over the control to thread 1, right? This is what basically is happening underneath. Now, if you look there, the function, uh, worker function, uh, is sleeping for around 0 0.05 seconds, which is much higher compared to 0 0.005. So when the first thread comes into play, it sleeps for 0 0.005 seconds, but the system CPU is told to switch in just 0 0.005, which is much lesser, right? So it'll check for any other thread that is free on the block, and it'll just switch to thread 1 and thread 0. If you can look at the string down below, you can see that thread 2 started it, it, it uh, Iteration first, so the zeroth iteration completes thread one, thread zero. That's probably not, not what you expected. You expected zero, one, and two. But it happens in, com in complete disorder since the threads are sleeping at, uh, for 0 0.05 seconds, right? Let's see a much simpler condensed example. So what are race conditions? So this is a simple example just to, you know, get it uh, done. Uh, uh, Completely. So yeah, consider two threads in our banking app. Now a user has an initial balance of 30, an amount of 100 is being uh, transferred simultaneously to the user by each one of the thread, one of, one of each threads, right? So the thread one currently reads the balance as 30. Now the thread one update the, updates the current balance to 130. But before it can save it to the database, thread two also reads the balance as 30. Now thread two updates the balance to 130, just adds 100 to the amount, whatever it is. But imagine now thread one was able to complete uh, the saving process to the database before thread two did. So the thread one is updated to 130. Now thread two writes uh, 100 more to the database. Now you have a completely uh, untrue amount in your database. So the, in midway of the operation of thread one, thread two was able to intervene and look at the resource. Now, this will cause uh, transaction issues if it's uh, used in something like a banking app. Let's see what happens in the next few slides. OK, so how do you make this problem go away? Well, a program is said to be thread safe if it can be run using multiple threads without any unexpected side effects. 
well, at least in the knowledge of uh, best of your knowledge, right? So if multiple threads are executing the same process, working on the same resource, and they can get you know consistent results without messing up each other's uh, results, you have a thread safe program. Well, we'll see how we can achieve that in a couple instances, right? So this is a uh, snapshot taken from Anthony Shaw in his talk called Unlocking, uh, Unlocking the Parallel Universe. So we have multiple ways of concurrency, which is threads, coroutines, multiprocessing, sub-interpreters, which are re really the cutting edge of Python, and you can look into it on his talk. OK, so the next slide. Right. So when should you worry about thread safety in your program, right? If it has mutable data and it does non-atomic operations on that particular data, then you should be worried. You should look into that code, right? Since threads share memory, look, if the thread share the memory location of the parent process, uh, every single thread has access to the same memory location and it can, you know, do weird things like the example we saw before. Now, if the data is not shared, we probably don't have a problem. And if the code is ex executed with atomic processes, we still don't have a problem. We probably don't have a problem. But if it's not atomic, then we do. So keep in mind those points and look at your code. And if it if it resembles what we said, then yeah, go fix that. So now we have a uh, thread, non-thread safe example. This is pretty sa safe, but I just wanted to, wanted you to show uh, show you that what is the expected result when it comes to this program. So what does this function do? It's printing the uh, getIdent function from the thread. What is the getIdent function? The getIdent returns the identifier of that particular thread instance. So, so we are printing from the thread 74112. Uh, if you look at the uh, print, uh, I mean, the string down below, the result down below. And now we have customized the end separator to print the same identifier, but we have mentioned that it as a separator, right? So now the expected result should be, since the identifiers are the same, printing from thread one number, uh, separator of the same number, and so on and so forth. But let's see what happens when we introduced, uh, introduce threading to this particular example. Okay, yeah, we can switch the slide, I guess. Yeah. So. If you see here, since the uh, the default of uh, the switching uh, switching time, which is default 0 0.005, the threads get uh, switched in between processes, right? So if you see the print statement down below, you can actually see that in the third line, it's printing from the thread 79484, but then it switches over to uh, the thread 72360, and it uh, prints the separator of 72360, followed by the, the separator of the previous thread, which is 79480. Now you can see the context switching between these threads is causing the program to re return results at random times, right? Not, not exactly random, the 0, 0, 0 0.005 seconds that I mentioned before. So let's see one more example. Okay, so everybody knows what a singleton class is. You should be only able to create one instance of that particular class. So this is a proper example. You create a singleton class, and if you look down below, it prints the ID of both the objects, and it has the same ID, right? But imagine we introduce threading to this. What happens? Well, the classes will enter the Dunder new method, and it'll look at look if the class has an instance, which it doesn't if the thread one looks at it. And uh, imagine there is thread one and thread two, right, in this context. So the thread one looks at it, uh, and this is the Dunder new function, looks if it uh, checks if it has an instance, it doesn't, so it creates new instance. At the same time, thread two also gets to the new method, checks if it has an instance already, which it doesn't, but both of these threads got the affirmative response that yes, this class does not have an instance. And both of them create different instances for the same class, and now you got two different IDs, which completely goes against the law of making singleton classes. So, so this is another non-thread safe example. Okay, so what do uh, what is the recommended method of doing this? So if we want to make uh, concurrent uh, executions of uh, programs, I mean threads, uh, just don't go use threads, right? Just use something, some other alternative method like Anthony Shaw mentioned in his talk. 
you have a uh, parallel process, I mean, sorry, you have uh, coroutines and so on and so forth. You can use that. And make your operations atomic. So that is the best method you can get, you know, consistent results and uh, not mess up your uh, program. And uh, stop sharing mutable data across threads. So if two threads have uh, the access to the same thing, it probably will mess it up unless you some, uh, use some kind of synchronization, synchronization primitives which will be explained by others in a couple uh, slides later on. So yeah, that's it for me, handing it over to you, Adarsh. Yeah, so uh, to solve the thread safety issues, we have uh, synchronization primitives. So we will uh, go over each of these one by one. This can be used to uh, coordinate between multiple threads. So let's uh, take a look at the lock. A lock is a synchronization primitive that allows only one thread to access a resource. So we can use uh, lock to mark critical sections and only uh, one thread can execute the code in the critical section concurrently. Next, uh, we have R lock. R lock is like an advanced version of the lock. It's a re-entrant lock. So it allows uh, the same thread to acquire the lock multiple times without causing a dead lock. So we will uh, see an example of R lock in the coming slides. Next, uh, we have semaphore. So semaphore is like uh, a counter. It uh, allows a certain number of threads to access the resource simultaneously. So we can limit uh, the concurrency and the number of threads that can access a piece of code simultaneously. So uh, it can be practically used in cases where we need to limit the number of concurrent connections in a database. For example, suppose we have, uh, in the case of connection pooling, suppose we have like limit on the number of concurrent connections, we can uh, maintain that using a semaphore. Next, uh, we can uh, we have event. So event is used for signaling. So it will help one thread to signal uh, to some other threads that something has happened, some particular condition has been met. Next, uh, we have condition. So condition is a synchronization primitive. Uh, that allow threads to wait for certain condition to be met. For example, uh, suppose we have uh, some queues and let uh, we can use condition to make a thread wait until the queue is filled. Next, uh, we have a uh, barrier. So barrier is like a gate. It allows entry uh, to that only after all of the threads have completed uh, the previous execution. So, uh, this can be uh, used to ensure that all the worker threads complete their individual tasks before they proceed to the next level. Now, uh, let's see a practical example of the uh, lock. So uh, here we can see we are creating a lock object uh, by creating an instance of threading.lock class. Here we have a thread function. Then uh, we are creating two threads, thread1 and thread2. Inside the third function, we can see that we have a statement log dot acquire. So uh, this is the statement we can use to acquire a log object. And at the last of the function, you can see there is a log, log dot release statement. So this will release the log. So it ensures that once a thread has acquired a log, other threads have to wait until it's released by the first acquirer. So we can uh, see the output, uh, which is given at uh, below the code snippet. You can see there are, uh, we are creating two threads. So you can see the first thread is uh, initially waiting to acquire the lock. Then uh, it actually acquires the lock. Inside, uh, between the acquire and uh, release statement, we can see uh, we have marked a critical uh, section of the code, which, uh, which does nothing much. It uh, just sleeps for five seconds. So we can see uh, initially uh, the thread one got the, uh, got the lock acquired. Next, uh, we can see that our second thread is waiting to acquire the lock. Uh, it's uh, waiting there. Only after it's being released by the first thread, we can see the lock is acquired by the second thread. So you can uh, take a look at the timestamps also. Between the two timestamps, there is a delay of five seconds. So uh, since our critical section is uh, being executed, uh, it sleeps for five seconds. So uh, the thread two is waiting uh, for five seconds to acquire the lock. So uh, this is how the symbol lock works. Next, we have uh, another way of like uh, acquiring and releasing the lock. It's using a context manager. So we can use, uh, similar to 
the uh, previous example, we can create a lock object and we can use the context manager statement with lock and we can uh, we can add the critical section code inside uh, the context manager block. So when the uh, control enters the context manager block, the acquire, acquire of the lock is automatically called and when it exits from the blo uh, block, the release method is automatically called. So uh, this is equivalent to what we have uh, seen in the previous call. Next, uh, we have a deadlock scenario. Deadlock means uh, the threads uh, get locked and uh, none of the threads can proceed its execution. And this uh, leads to an uh, infinite lock where uh, the code, uh, the program execution cannot proceed further. So uh, this is an example of a uh, transfer between bank accounts. So we have a bank account class. We can see there is a deposit function and an update balance function. We have a uh, lock object at the self.lock attribute. It's, uh, we are using a simple lock in that case. You can see inside the deposit uh, function, we are entering uh, the lock. We are acquiring the lock using uh, the with statement. Then inside that, we are calling the update balance function to update the balance. So what happens inside the update balance is that it's also uh, trying to acquire the same lock. You can see uh, the statement there. Uh, this will cause a deadlock. Like uh, currently, uh, consider we have one thread. So uh, it's acquiring a lock from the deposit function. And when it uh, reaches the update balance function, it's being called from inside of the deposit function. It tries to uh, again acquire the same lock. So a simple lock is made. It will not allow uh, re entrancy. So uh, this will be the output. Like we have uh, two threads. The first thread is uh, waiting and it is acquiring the lock. Then, uh, then we can see uh, it acquires the lock of uh, first function, like a deposit function. And uh, sorry, we have three threads. So the first uh, first, uh, first thread uh, acquires the lock for the deposit function. Then other two threads are waiting. Then we can see our first thread is trying to acquire the same lock for the update balance function. But since it's uh, like it's already acquired by it in the previous function, the deposit function, it cannot uh, proceed function proceed further, and it, uh, this will lead to an infinitely uh, waiting scenario. So uh, we can use an R log to uh, fix this case. So initially, we have uh, we can see that in the account we have self load balance equal to zero. We have initialized uh, the account balance as zero, and we are trying to uh, use three threads uh, and uh, transferring the amount of hundred using each thread. So here, uh, the only change is that we are uh, initializing the self dot lock with an R lock instance, threading dot R lock instance. Then uh, if we try to execute that, we can see that initially uh, we have, uh, or we have similar to the previous example, we have uh, three threads. It allows for, uh, we can see the first thread, 23128, uh, the thread with the ID 23128. So it acquires the lock for the deposit function. And similarly, we can see uh, it again acquires the lock for update balance function also. Since it's a re-entrant lock, if it's currently uh, holding the lock object, it can re-enter to the critical section. So uh, we can use R lock in scenarios where we are calling uh, critical sections recursively. Like in our case, we are use, we have two functions uh, which need to be uh, locked. Next, uh, let's uh, look into our previous examples and how we can make these threads safe. So we have a banking app. Uh, this is the transfer money code. Here we can see that initially, uh, the initial two lines are just building the SQL queries. We can uh, omit that from the critical section. They are just creating, just preparing the SQL statement and nothing is being executed. Then we have an account lock, which is a lock instance. And uh, we wrap that into this context manager block. Uh, we have code for executing the SQL queries. We have code for updating the balance as well as saving the updated balance to DB. So using this lock, we have uh, made the operation atomic. So all these uh, operations happen uh, as a single piece and only one thread can execute uh, these at the same time. So yeah, uh, that uh, will fix our problem. Uh, we have seen in the first case, in our banking application case. Next, uh, let's look into the uh, like production consideration. So this uh, simple example here is not suitable for production. 
This is because uh, there can be multiple instances of a Python application. Uh, similarly, maybe we can uh, have some other applications accessing the database simultaneously. So uh, whenever we are working with some uh, critical code, we should enable lock at the source of truth level. Here, uh, we can use the locks, but SQL provides us uh, database level logs. So in uh, such a scenario, we can use database, uh, le uh, database level logs and uh, it's a recommended practice for production scenarios. Here we can uh, see the statement uh, using our SQL model library. We have the statement and uh, it has a with for update function appended, we can see. So that will uh, acquire a row level log for this session and only uh, the other threads can access the value only after our current thread completes this execution. Next, uh, we can look at the printer example. So uh, as we have seen, the print function is non-atomic. It, uh, it has one operation of printing the message and another operation of printing the separator. So uh, to make it atomic, we are just uh, using a symbol lock, uh, similar to one uh, we used previously. We are uh, defining a print lock object and we are using context manager uh, to wrap our uh, non-atomic operation. So we can see uh, the problem is uh, fixed now. Next, uh, in case of singleton also, we can uh, solve that using a lock similarly. So initially we can see if the class instance is not, uh, we are trying to acquire a lock so that uh, there is no interference from other threads. Then once we acquire the lock, we are again checking if the instance is already not. So uh, suppose we are checking if another thread already got the lock and it has created an instance in the meantime. So uh, we are wrapping that with our lock to ensure that uh, there is actually only a single instance is being created in a multi-thread environment. Next, uh, summarizing everything. So uh, suppose we have a single threaded or normal code and we, we are moving to a multi-threading based model. So uh, we should keep in mind that the code we are working with might not be designed for thread safety. It can include uh, maybe third-party library codes or even standard library code. Like we have uh, seen the example of print function. So when we are uh, running code in a multi-threaded environment, maybe it can have unintended effects. So uh, before switching to multi-threading, we should check for shared mutable data. We should check if uh, the data is shared across threads and uh, these are mutable accidentally. And uh, in that case, we need to add synchronization primitives. Also, uh, we should uh, check if the atomicity requirements are not are met. Otherwise, uh, we have to implement a primitive uh, to ensure that. So as the CPython docs say, when in doubt, uh, we should use a mutex, like we should uh, use a mutual exclusion primitives like uh, logs to ensure that our code is spread safe. So uh, that's it. Thanks everyone. So you can uh, visit our LinkageQ links to get the talk slides and uh, to connect with us. Thank you. Thanks everyone.